Hello and welcome back to The Commonplace. My name is Autumn and I am joined today by a new to me friend, Haley. Haley, hello. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Autumn. Oh, I'm very excited about this. So uh, maybe a couple months ago, I can't exactly remember when this happened, but I realized Haley was tagging me almost weekly on Instagram in these very cute photos (laughs) and I didn't have any idea why. And (laughs) Haley is the queen of the tease caption. So Haley has a project, um, a sub stack that we are going to talk about today, but she is great at sharing the ideas you will find in it without telling you too much. So I would read these captions like Gnosticism and dumb phones, Narnia and like acedia. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but I'm kind of interested. These are words that would make me like follow someone to their house or basement. So I would like to know more about what this is. And I realized after a couple of weeks that Haley had a link to a sub stack and this is called Life Considered and is the thing we're going to talk about today. And I wanted to bring Haley in to talk in my Mother Academia series because I'm often asked, I love that you love these ideas and you've made up your own course of study like you're in school, but I'm not exactly sure how to get started on a practice like this. And Haley has a unique practice that I don't really know of anyone else doing because it's kind of a practice for itself and it's beautiful and I wanted to talk to her about it. So that's what we're going to do today. I hope everyone enjoys it, but we're going to start. Haley, if you would please tell us a little bit about you and your family. Hi. Yeah. So I'm Haley. Um, I'm married to Jacob. We've been married for five and a half years. We live in southern Wisconsin um, in a smaller city. We have for the past two and a half years. Uh, Previously, we were on Long Island for his work. And then before that, we were married in central Missouri. Um, And I have lived in more places than I care to share before that. So, uh, so yeah, we, we've been living here. We have three boys. Uh, they are four, three, and one. Um, so I guess this project has happened pretty much over the course of my early motherhood, which is also fun to kind of see my evolving of a person and a mother. Um, so yeah, I stay home, whatever you want to call that situation, um, where I'm home with the boys. Um, my husband's a chemist. And yeah, we're just trying to figure out life together. We haven't actually been married that long, (laughs) Uh, had babies right away. So yeah, we're just kind of in the thick of it. Yes, indeed. Um, So I love that you mentioned that you've been doing this over the course of your motherhood because so with Life Considered, basically the way I think about it is that every week, this lovely collection of truth, goodness, and beauty lands in my inbox. And I don't just mean it as like, that's the phrase that we use in classical education from the angle I'm kind of coming from, but honestly, Haley could be my online curator, like the things she pulls together. She'll go through what she's reading, what she's listening to, a series she's working through. Um, And it's amazing because it's very Charlotte Mason to me and that you don't add a lot of your own personal commentary. At most, you'll be like, remember this and link to something else that you've included before, but you really just offer ideas consistently to others. Like you just share on this journey you're on in your own intellectual life. At the bottom is the first thing that caught my eye. You have see this week in previous years. So 2023, 2022, 2021. Is it five years down there or four? Uh, there's four. There's four years. 2020 okay. was a gap year. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Yes. So yes. Four years. Okay. All right. So you have these four years and you can, for me, I saw that and was like, wow, this has been a long-term practice for this woman. She has regularly been engaging with ideas, continuing to pursue them to greater depths, looking at them from other angles. I've looked through a lot of them. I've gone back to see kind of how these things connected because I'm a footnotes chaser. So I can kind of chase my own reading life by the footnotes I was finding and then reading after. And so I wanted to see kind of how this came out. And it's a very long-term practice for you in these kind of bite-sized chunks, it seems, week by week. And so I would love to know, how did it start? What was the original idea? What was the inspiration? And how did you get going? Uh, Good question. Um, I guess it started in 2019. Um, We had been married the previous summer. um, And that's the year that we had our first child. Um, So he was also finishing up grad school. Um, and this was, yeah, several years ago, it seems, but even then I still had these kind of like, I don't know, just these weird feelings about the way in which 
things are shared online, especially in social media. Um, and I have always been more of a bookish person, um, you know, an introvert, always in my head type of person. And so I kept feeling this weird, like, um, this feeling that the things that I wanted to share or dialogue with people about, um, it didn't really seem to be the right place um, on social media to share those types of things. Um, I don't know if it was like Neil Postman or someone else who talked about the medium being the message. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was like, man, the things that I come across often on social media are not things that I'm inclined to linger over and like, you know, dig my teeth into it's kind of like grab it as it comes and quickly pass to the next thing. Yeah. And so that's, uh, that was kind of the impetus to create more of a slower form of engaging with things. Even if I wasn't the person, uh, like creating the words per se, um, I guess that's my whole thing. I love like curating the good thoughts of others, um, as a practice. Um, and so, it's not really a good way to do that, <laughs> like in a like in an Instagram slide or something. So, the slower practice was really my goal of having both me and whoever wanted to interact with it as an outflow of what I was doing to do so in a manner like appropriate to the work and not just mm -hmm. a passing passing thought as you go on to the next slide or whatever mm -hmm. is current these days. Yeah, I love that. Yes. Uh, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death talks about the form, the medium, and how much that changes then how we interact and understand knowledge, like what is shared um, in our thought life. That's a great book. I've talked about it before in my Mother Culture series. So anyone looking for a great read, uh, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death is great. So I love hearing that you, one, I knew as just receiving your substack that there was an honoring of the person on my end, but then also you're honoring the creator of the words that you're sharing too, by putting them in this form, because you're right. Instagram trains us to swipe, 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 swipe up, up, up. We don't stop and pause and life considered all the things you bring into it. It's something I say for the weekends when I can like really sit down and read something with coffee. Like the kids aren't necessarily crawling all over me and I'm not rushing off to the school day. It's something that I look forward to because you do curate such lovely things. Um, I've always wondered each week if these are the things you've read or listened to just that week, or are you collecting them sort of into um, complimentary ideas and thoughts. Does that make sense? Or maybe both? Like, did you read a book a week? A good question. <laughs> I've had people ask me this before. Yeah. <laughs> so those are the books that I finished that week. Right. Um, okay. And yeah, I don't claim to be like completing no. even like a mother academia type, um, thing, but so yeah, those are the books that I finished that week. Lately, I have been trying to incorporate some more reading or listening that correspond to some of the books mm -hmm. because there is so much out there that you know you can go further into whatever book that has been written whether it's an old mm -hmm. book or a new book of someone trying to cultivate these ideas you know they do mm -hmm. the podcast rounds they write things to kind of flesh out their ideas and so I want to honor yeah those books that have a lot written about them mm -hmm. so some of it is uh, expanding on those ideas of whatever book or books I've read. Hmm. Um, and then I think lately I've tried to like group kind of like three different sections of kind of common themes um, of essays or articles that kind of go together. Yes. Um, and I, it's funny because I, maybe like four years into this, I was reading Karen Glass's Consider This. Mm -hmm. And Great. she has this whole, well, it's not her idea, but, you know, the classical Charlotte Mason idea of synthetic thinking. Um, mm -hmm. I was reading that and I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I'm trying to do in my newsletter. Like, that's what you do. Yes, 100%. <laughs> like, I, I guess I didn't have a name for it, but that's what I was trying to do is there are, yes, we should be reading old things, but there are people writing uh, beautiful and worthwhile, you know, essays, if that's your thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so I do have a Google Doc where I have categories of like nice. uh, topics. And so I kind of gleaned from that as it seems appropriate to put things together. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I do think that as a practice for me, um, it's good to it, kind of in my digital commonplace, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, even if I'm not narrating, which I am inspired to do after your recent video, <laughs> um, kind of a way for me to solidify the ideas is to put it up against other essays or ideas that have, you know, a thread that is common or um, put next to each other, they kind of complement or bring out different things. Um, and so I think that practice has been fun to, I don't know, see how different things can sharpen the effect of other ideas by like reading them together or putting them together. Because mm -hmm. like, there's a lot on the internet, you know, like, I could just be like reading stuff and reading stuff with like no purpose. Um, and you know, sometimes we do that. But the whole point of this is to be like, well, what are the the nuggets or what are these things that should be dwelled on a little bit more? And maybe some other essays could pull that out or other ideas can juxtapose or complement. So mm -hmm. I kind of have like different groupings where some common themes will come up and that synthetic thinking just kind of like gets to gets to going. Yeah. Well, I want to commend you because you do. I do. I do think that you put people into conversation with one another, even if at the time of writing them, they weren't aware of the other article. But that is something lovely about the great conversation is, yes, we have our old books and we love them, but we don't want to be, as Lewis would call them, chronological snobs in either direction, um, thinking mm -hmm. that only the old is good or only the old is bad and the good is the new or the old. Um, and so we do have people who are continuing with the conversation right now and they're writing online because it's the medium that they have in order to share their work. And you bring them in, but then you talk about books and you put all these people from different times and places into conversation and then invite us as the receiver of the Substack to join in too. Um, and that's the great thing I think about Substack is I, I do think that the quality of the comments left and the conversations that are had on Substack are different than any other like online social media type platform. Mm -hmm. Even when I only just read them, I don't really jump in them. I do think there's, um, there's more engaging of ideas still, or maybe it'll hopefully continue, but still on Substack that's really unique. Now you kind of yeah. made a joke that you're not doing a mother academia, but I specifically wanted to talk to you about this practice because I think it is a form of mother academia. You have a regular habit, you are engaging with ideas, Hopefully you'll narrate because I do think that's important, but you are, you are engaging in this practice and I think it's just a different way it can look. And that's what's so encouraging about it is that you're a mom with three really little kids and you are finding the time to read and listen to things that your mind can then wrestle with. So in Mason world, for those who don't know, we have this thing called uh, mother culture and it's not actually a Mason thing, just something that happened in the parents review. And it's kind of taken legs and grown into so many new, like new and other things. But originally it was just reading for about 30 minutes a day because moms are persons and we need to engage with ideas. We need to work through them. We need to love them. We need to argue with them. We need to be humbled by them. All these things that I think you do very well with life considered and me just assuming the reading life in order to create it must demand these things. But You've got little kids, a lot of the people who listen to The Commonplace do as well, and they struggle to find the time or to build the habits needed to regularly be reading and listening to quality things. What kind of habits do you think you now have in place over the last four years um, that you had to grow the muscles for in order to make this a regular thing in your life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I guess you've talked about like in like gluttony, like book gluttony, that can definitely become a thing. Yeah, <laughs> Even like audiobooks yeah. and all of the good things. Um, so that's a constant thing for me is to like not have that be a thing because um, a lot of, like I do listen to a lot of audiobooks. I'm always going through a physical book at some point, like in the evenings um, constantly, but I am like a slower reader and always have even before the internet. Um, and so I think part of my learning style is just, um, I think I am more of an auditory learner. Uh, it's not just like a, I just don't want to read. It's like, <laughs> sure, I, but yeah. I just do retain a lot more when I'm moving, doing like more mindless tasks. Um, so I guess a lot of my audiobook time is built in with like chores or, you know, keeping an eye on my kids outside. Mm -hmm. It's just with three little boys, honestly, there's just a lot of chaos. Yeah. <laughs> and 
so if I'm like keeping an eye on them, I don't want to like have my my eyes on something that mm-hmm. um, they don't need to be on. And so if I can listen to a book at this time in my life, that's working for me. Obviously, you know, physical books are valuable, and I do try to incorporate those in the evenings, but. Um, there's just a lot of housework when you're living at home with yes. a bunch of kids. I'm like, wow, I am exhausted at the end of the day. And yes, I should bring them into those habits. Um, but I've just kind of been in the thick of it, like in these little years. And so with those household tasks, that's when I do a lot of my listening. And, mm-hmm. and then as far as like reading, I do try to maintain a boundary over the quiet time or nap time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying not to have that be like a, always like a catch up time on other things that need to be done. But yeah, you know, I know people maybe do like homeschool prep or they run businesses. And so whatever time people find for those, that's probably what I'm using for, you know, reading, um, filling myself in those ways. That's it. I guess I'm always like amazed at people who have like businesses or are homeschooling because I'm not yet at a homeschooling stage. Right. Uh, and I certainly don't have a business. So but when you have those littles, mine were three and three years. So they were kind of their own little pod too. And you're at the three and under four and under stage. And you're like, well, there's never time in the day to homeschool someone, you know, it's just because you're in those littler years. Like this could never be done. It could never happen. And yet it does. They start to age out and they start doing different things. And it really does come. But I even think what you said there that the people who have a business or they do something like that, which takes intentional time. You say no to other things so that you have the time, the mental energy, the physical energy to do these things. And you've then in that sense created this like this love, this practice you want, and you're gonna have to protect it, protect the time for it. Kind of set it up, knowing that we always have to hold things open handed, right? As moms who are at home with their kids, we can't just be like, this is now my time that I read. It does not matter that you are hitting your brother. You know, like we can't do that. But at the same time, it it is a saying of no to other things in order to say yes to something like this. Um, you also mentioned that Google Doc that you keep things kind of categorized. Do you have a similar one for things you'd like to come back to and read that maybe you don't have time for right now? Do you keep a like a two? Oh TV no, that's what list? I mean. Oh, like, that is the two yard like, list. Okay. Yeah. So I'll come across things. There's just a lot of things on the internet, and I'm like, you know, I really can't have time for everything, but I'm going to mm-hmm. bookmark that, and maybe it'll it'll correspond to something really great in the future. And so I do keep a to be read. Okay. So it is TBR. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was after the fact, if you organize them, but that means it is mother academia. I have a TBR too. It's my organized way. I want to go there with my reading. It's exactly that. Um, And I think that's always helpful to know too. That right there is a gift of humility. If you'll accept it, you'll never read all the lovely things, whether they be essays or books. Um, Wes Callahan Mm -hmm. talks about having libraries and like why he has such a big library. And part of it is humility. He will never know everything in all these great books. And I think that can translate to this as well. Like you, you already cover so many beautiful things. And yet at the end of the day, like we are limited, finite (laughs) creatures. We're not going to know all things and we can be okay with the fact that we didn't get to everything too. Um, Okay. So it's kind of a big one. It's a two-parter. It's hard to necessarily answer this maybe while you're still in the middle of it, but this practice over the last number of years as a wife and as a, like a woman, a mother, well, no, that those are two different things. (laughs) Let's do as a woman and as a mother for this conversation, how would you say this practice has formed you in those two ways, two roles? Um, I guess, gosh, I don't know. As far as a wife, <laughs> we uh, threw that one out. I guess we'll, wife. We'll do woman and mother. <laughs> right, wives are important. Sorry, Jacob. Um, I guess. I guess I will start with the the mother aspect. Um. Uh, I guess I'll backtrack and say even like uh, coming across your stuff. Um, I think it was Tish Oxenrider that maybe shared something of yours a while back. But you were honestly one of the only, like, there's a lot of homeschool content out there. But I think you were one of the only ones who I really, like, uh, clicked with because I was like, oh, she's, like, trying to find, like, the thing behind the thing, like, the philosophy behind, like, why we do stuff. Like, I don't know. Anyone could tell me, like, about curriculum or 
you know, X, Y, Z thing to pick out for school. But if we're talking about homeschooling, um, and we're not even there yet, we haven't decided on schooling. <laughs> um, but um, I think for me in the whole person, mm-hmm. I think it's so important to me. Um, even before we had kids, before, um, you know, I was even learning about classical Charlotte Mason. Like I wanted to be formed as a person. And so I think you do that very well. That's like a lot of the draw, I think for a lot of people to your content. Um, and so I guess that's what I'm kind of trying to do with my newsletter for myself and then whoever wants to join in. Um, is that, yeah, I'm trying to, in like a sea of books and internet reading, um, I'm trying to pick out those things that are worthy of, you know, at the end of the week sharing. Um, I don't just want to go through the week and be like, well, you know, just another week of going through the motions. I can't remember anything I read. Um, Mm -hmm. It's being cognizant of, you know, if I were to tell someone, what are the best things that I engaged with this week, um, books or otherwise, like, would I have anything? Um, and that's not to say like your mind is the only important part of you, but, um, it's certainly uh, one part of us and that can also atrophy or be, um, dumbed down with like banal things. And so, yeah, I think just being formed as a, a person before, I am someone who's trying to perhaps educate my kids. I think that's really important to me. Yeah. Um, And so it makes me cognizant of what I'm taking in and what is worth sharing with others. So yeah, uh, I think that's one thing. Yeah. I think a lot of women realize that it sounds like you were kind of ahead of the game, at least compared to my story where it was having my being pregnant with my daughter, my oldest, that was kind of the impetus of, Oh, what do I take in? what am I feeding on? What ideas, what images, how am I forming my imagination? Mm -hmm. What is this doing? Um, It really was motherhood that kind of supercharged that for me and gave me more of a focus, which I think is true of a lot of women when they come into this world. It seems to happen in those early years when they're trying to think about schooling and they realize that education is a whole formation of a person. And that really just blows your mind when you come through the wardrobe. Um, But I think that makes, and that makes perfect sense. And I think um, it does, your mind is a part of you but we all, and not the whole of you. And yet we also know that it's how we engage with ideas because they're spiritual things. And so if we are going to live these ideas out in an embodied way through our fingertips, we must first engage with the idea. We must allow it to humble us and shape us and pull us in a certain direction that we would call the good life. Um, and that picture is always having to be made more clear, right? It's always having to shift to be truer um, according to what God says, but through all these lovely and beautiful things. I think one thing you mentioned as well, that I want to pull out for people is that this kind of practice can also remind you of goodness in the world. I think whether you're at home or maybe you just spend a lot of time online with the crazy news cycle or whatever it is, or you're just drowning in a lot of little people and it seems mundane and that nothing really matters and everything's always sticky, all that sort of stuff that I think we go through in early motherhood, that each week you've paused to offer a glimpse of beauty. And that's what all my favorite characters in books do. They can see beautiful things when everything else is bleak. And that sort of muscle is incredible. Like that's the type of muscle I think my kids have to have this one when they leave my house. They have to have an eye for beautiful, good, true things, even when the world is broken, even when it's been a bad week. If their eyes can see that, their eyes can see the fingerprints of God in their life. Like they can see, like I think of uh, the horse and his boy, Aslan's rarely in the book. But if you've been reading Narnia, you know where he is the whole time because you know what it looks like. And so teaching ourselves, teaching our kids, bringing this into our lives in a practice form where you can find what's good each week, that's also, I think, a pretty magnificent muscle to cultivate. Yes. Um, let's see. I think I was going to bring up, so one like framework that came up recently, but it kind of explains, I think, my another drive of my newsletter Um this theologian, Kirsten Sanders, she had this post on um, this early Christian distinction um, between what's called curiositas and studiositas. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm. And that's been a really helpful framework to sift through, like, what is even worth sharing? Because, um, yes, we have, like, good, true, and beautiful things, but... um, 
Let me see. Uh, so Curiositas, she says, um, in the second century was deemed a vice. Well, mm -hmm. curiosity was mm -hmm. deemed a vice um, by Tertullian um, for, you know, several hundred uh, centuries. Uh, it's just a bad thing. And that just being like, yeah. Um, and I guess if you juxtapose that with studiositas, um, curiositas or curiosity is just an undisciplined desire for knowledge. And so just, you know, I just want to know anything about everything. Um, it's just kind of like unbridled and self-focused. Um, yeah. It's not right knowledge. Um, and so when she brought up what studiositas is, um, she said it's a form of knowledge that might lead to an awareness of the world and its gifts, but also an awareness of ourselves as creatures. And so mm. um, this will form us the knower, a conformity to the thing known, and so might occur as skill or training. It is right knowledge and resists novelty. Um, and so I think this might just be another way of explaining something that's good, true, or beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a lot of like novelty out there. There's a lot of just writing for the sake of writing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, is it forming us to love and know God and ourselves better? Um, and so she goes on to say, Kristen Sanders, that the internet is just full of kind of this glut of just like, any kind of writing and anyone can do it, which is a good thing, but also like, are we being trained in our appetites to love and desire those good things that um, show us who we really are and who we ought to be, show us who God is and about his world. And so, I don't know, the whole, the whole newsletter is kind of my practice of um, trying to take in and be formed by those things that are worth, dwelling on and yes. whoever no, wants that's to great. listen in or read in they can also uh <laughs> glean from the overflow but i'm certainly not preaching to anyone it's also for my own sake <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Um, we've been doing a virtues and vices course in Common House. And so one thing that has kind of been shocking to some with our modern minds is that vice is the disordered love of a good thing. So it's not that we love all these evil, icky things. It's that we often, it's the disordered affection, this disordered desire for. And so this unbridled desire for knowledge immediately made me think, of, oh, of course, that's why it was a vice, because it was a disordered love of knowledge. And in our modern time where we tend to be more utilitarian and we want to just take, consume, manipulate, use, and prove for whatever our own individual purposes are, it's great that we can access anything all the time. You can Google anything. You can listen to a podcast 24 hours a day if you want to, whatever it is. Um, and yet that's a disordered desire for knowledge. Um, we're not even pursuing it for the right means. We don't love it the right way. And then it's impossible for the thing to do to us what it ought to be doing. That's actually, um, we kind of, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but before we hit record, Haley and I were talking about how this is life considered is not like a business. She's not trying to make it into this huge project or anything. It's just a practice for itself, which is so classical <laughs> to love the thing for itself that we're not seeking some other utilitarian purpose. And I know I've struggled and talked about this in Common House before with my own reading life because I read so much for work that I have to protect what is my non-utilitarian reading. Like this is just for me to do. And of course it's going to, the ideas are going to work themselves in and connect to other things. That's the science of relations. You can't not have a mind do that. That's what it's made to do. But I have to make sure that all of my reading is not slowly turning into a resource, a podcast episode, a video script, you know, because that's not the point. I'm not reading in order to do something with it. I have to protect my own, my mother culture, my own reading like that. Um, so I love all of that. And I think all of that would be deeply formative in a, in a great way. And I hope people are hearing little bits they can take if they're beginning this practice. Um, from reading through it, it seems like, and listening to you now, that this has just become part of your life. Like this self-education is kind of like breathing. I know that for a lot of people when they first start something or they come into this world, feels like a lot is forced. Like, okay, I'm listening to people who are wiser than I am. And they're telling me I should be doing these sorts of things. I should be reading these sorts of things, but the personal desire isn't quite there yet. So it does feel forced. And yet after a while, things do become habit. 
you actually find that you are loving these things. It is becoming more natural. Even something like tea time with little kids it can feel really hard and forced when you first start trying to go with little kids and poetry books and cups of hot liquid. And then after you know a couple of years, it's just this thing that happens all the time. It's just this really delightful thing. You just kind of becomes part of your life. And I think self-education is like that. It can feel forced, but then it can become something that's just like breathing. And that's obviously the hope. So for the mom who's brand new, it's like, I would love to start something like this, some regular practice of engaging with lovely and noble ideas. Haley, what would your encouragement be to them? Either practically like, hey, here's some things you could do or just encouragement in the immaterial way. Um, well, um, I think there's, I mean, there's like a ton of book lists out there if you're trying to, you know, find some of those good books, um, whether it's a university or I know there's like groups like the Catherine Project, Well-Read Mom, um, mm -hmm. Society for Women of Letters. They have these like study kind of groups. Um, but I would say, I guess just be, take those moments that you have um, that are being filled by something because we're doing something all day and um, you could just choose like one book to go through slowly and just chew on that in your downtime, um, depending on what your learning style is, if that's reading or audio. Um, I think we, maybe you've mentioned this, but we tend to put learning on this pedestal of something that requires a lot of time. Um, when really, I think it just requires more diligence, if anything. Um, these pockets of time that that do add up. Um, if you listen to something or read something 20 minutes a day, maybe twice a day, it's like, well, man, that adds up over time. So I think focus more on diligence over quantity of time if you're engaging with a book or anything. Um, and let's see. I know this is more like lower than books, but I have found it helpful if I'm going through like a podcast series that like I really respect the person producing it or making it like your stuff, um, like go through all of their stuff. If like we tend to just be like one off kind of listeners of things and sometimes that's fine. But um, I think just like a book, if you want to engage with like a creator or an author or maybe someone who has more knowledge than you like go through all their stuff or a big chunk of it. Don't just have a one-off episode and then go to the next thing. Like you can dig into it like you would a book. Um, so that's kind of a more technological or modern uh, approach um, in tandem with books. But I think that's one thing mm -hmm. I've noticed um, if I am willing to dig into someone's work and go through and see their, the whole picture of what they're trying to do. I think it's more honoring mm -hmm. of their work and you get a better idea of what they're about than just, you know, seeing what's on the YouTube algorithm next. Um, or yeah. I would say along with that, you could focus on perhaps one author or one, um, one topic. If you choose one thing, like one author, one topic, um, one book and then resources that come with that. Um, mm -hmm. I think you can delve into a lot of depths even there because even I will yeah. read books. Um, and I'm like, man, well, th this person has written a million other things. <laughs> I could, I could read everything that they've written or I could mm -hmm. read everything that people have written about them. Um, so if you just focus <laughs> on one thing, one topic, um, gosh, you could go deep. I don't know. There's a lot of ways to go about it, but um, I guess just be diligent with the time that you have, no matter what you're choosing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm actually really, gra really glad rather that you mentioned that because I, I meant to ask you about your seemingly great self-discipline because I knew when I emailed Haley about this conversation, I was going to have to explain to her or send her a link to Mother Academia because I've watched each week, Haley is moving very methodically through 
my YouTube videos one after another. And so I knew she was not up to date currently possibly with what I am doing right now because she's working through it so steadily. And I am someone, and I know other people are, we have shiny object syndrome. And it's not that we're trying to go buy new things. It's that we find new books or new essays or all these things all the time. And each one sounds so great that we're like, I got to go here. I got to go here. And then you end up not being diligent, not working on one thing. Um, And so actually that's a fantastic tip to just kind of decide. It really sounds like a course of study. Like, okay, well, I'm just going to work through all the resources of, you know, the commonplace, or I'm going to read all of C.S. Lewis. Like, I'm just going to really read through here. I'm going to focus on this idea. I want to know more about the liberal arts this year. So I'm going to read through these great, you know, great recommendations for liberal arts. I think it's actually a really helpful thing because it is easy. We are kind of trained to just jump around to whatever the internet throws at us through the algorithm rather than setting an intention and then sticking to it. And that's been a part of Mother Academia. That's a part of what I've enjoyed just in those uh, Instagram tags when I didn't exactly know what was going on was that you were clearly doing something with the commonplace. And I think that self-discipline is a muscle and it's hard in our modern age where, like we've talked about, you could really go any direction and read anything if you want to. Um, So I think that's a fantastic tip. But um, I will be linking above and below and all the things to Life Considered so that you can um, sign up and receive the great gift that is this amazing Substack. I don't know if I should call them newsletters, Substacks, the Substack newsletter. Um, It really is something I look forward to each week because I think Haley does a tremendous job gathering lovely things worth your time things that you will mull over, like your mind will have things to chew on. So also, if you're someone who's like, I'd love to start reading these sorts of things, where do I start? Well, I would recommend, honestly, that you could just get life considered in your inbox and just start reading through it consistently because you will find lovely thought threads to chase and and all sorts of things. But Haley, do you do, you do anything else anywhere else, just so I know? <laughs> uh, no, I do not. Nope. That's okay, I, I just had to ask. I think I essentially <laughs> abandoned Instagram yeah, that's pretty much where I am. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know if we're nearing the end, but I will say, as far as a woman in particular, which I think is a majority of your audience, maybe not all, but I would definitely recommend. Um, there's a book. It's called "With All Her Mind." Um, it's edited and compiled by Rachel Bullman. Um, it's a collection of essays. I think they're all Catholic women. So it is from a Catholic perspective Um, and I really found it helpful and uh, encouraging. Um, I think it's kind of a riff, they say, from, there's a book called The Intellectual Life by, I'm going to butcher it, A.G. Sertolongis. Sertolongis. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And so I think in the foreword, she talks about how like she read that a long time ago and she was like, well, this is great. But I do think maybe we need like a, a female spin on this. Um, and so not everyone necessarily who contributes is like a wife and a mother. That's honestly the whole point is that like mm-hmm. women look a lot of different ways. Um, uh, and so I love the span of women in that book, um, single, older, younger married professional or not um they all have kind of the spin on what the intellectual life looks like for them but um in any Mm -hmm. case it's all pointing towards love of god and so how do we use our whole person including our mind um to do that and so yeah it's not going to look any one way but i would recommend that book for anyone who wants some more encouragement it sounds like a great suggestion. Considering the conversation we're having where we've made up this thing called Mother Academia, like we can do this at home. It can look this way. It's fine. Like we can we can just pursue these things on our own. So um, Haley, thank you so much for joining me today and being willing to share about your Substack. I really do love it. I hope you feel encouraged. It's a tremendous project. I know it would be just if you did it and never put it on the internet, but I have been encouraged by it, uh, challenged by many of the pieces I've read and I've just really enjoyed it. Like it's something I look forward to. So thank you for your efforts in putting it now truly well thank you it's always nice to know people read it uh but thank <laughs> yes. you yes, thank you too. absolutely okay well everyone else i'll see you next time